Hi, welcome to Teardown Tuesday. We've got an exciting one for you today. It's an AED, an automatic external defibrillator. Uh, this one's called the Samaritan Pad, and these are, of course, designed to uh, uh, shock your heart and restart it if you have a heart attack. Fantastic. Thank you very much to uh, George Miska for sending this one into the mailbag a long, long time ago. Sorry, I've only just got around to it. And uh, he, uh, this is a fully working one, but um, ta-da! It is missing the battery pack. George actually, uh, it, it, it expired apparently. Um, so this was the battery pack that was in there. A whole bunch of CR123 lithium primaries in there. Um, just, you know, ultrasonically welded together. Got some uh, hot melt in there as well to keep them together. Presumably they were, uh, you know, shrink packaged up or something like that. And uh, they were sitting inside here. Um, of course, it's a basically a single use type device. These are primary type things. This is actually one of these uh, uh, like public access devices where you like might leave them in a public location in a building or you know some other uh, area or something like that. And if somebody's having a heart attack, then so goes the theory. Uh, Joe Average, hence the name, the Samaritan. The, a good Samaritan comes up, Joe Average, and um, uses this thing to uh, hopefully. Um, attached to somebody having a heart attack. But these ones designed for such use are fully automatic, so you really can't kill, you know, like a live person if they've just fainted or something like that. they very smart. They automatically uh, monitor the heart first to make sure. And then they give these uh, lead indicators here. Um, and it's got voice prompting as well. So this one's only got two buttons, power and shock here. And uh, you turn it on and then it'll voice prompt you whether or not it's an adult or or a child because uh, adults will have a different uh, energy level, a shock energy level, around about, this one's about 150 to 200 joules, but some of these can go up to uh, 300 or 350 joules, I've read. Uh, this one in particular sets uh, 50 joules for a child, so lower energy, about you know one quarter the energy of an adult. And we've got our two uh, pads here. It shows you exactly where to put the uh, pads on the person. Uh, if every if it doesn't detect a, you know, a heartbeat and everything else or an erratic heartbeat, it decides whether or not to shock person. It'll say stand back and press the shock button, boom, and it will uh, shock them with a biphasic uh, waveform. And here's a look at the uh, waveform. Around about 10 milliseconds or something like that, it's called biphasic because it goes positive first and negative. Older devices from, you know, a few decades back didn't do this. They had a monophasic uh, one where it only went positive and shocked you. But the newer models like these ones um, use a biphasic pulse like that. And for those playing along at home, this is the HeartSign Samaritan Pad SAM 300P, manufactured by HeartSign Technologies Limited in uh, the island. Um, basically Belfast in the United Kingdom. So hi to all my Irish viewers, to be sure, to be sure. And there's the instructions on the back on how to use it. Turn it on, remove the pads, place the pads on the bare chest. Stone clear, if advised, press shock button. As I said, it's got voice prompting, so it'll have like a pre-recorded uh, voice chip, one of those uh, vocoder uh, type chips uh, pre-recorded in there. And if needed, begin CPR. So I think it only like has one go at it or something like that. Anyway, certainly with the lithium primary batteries, this wouldn't be, although you can actually get new pads for it, I think. Anyway, um, these were expiry 2017, so I don't know why this one expired, because it says uh, December 2016, but George said that this one had expired, so here's your pads. Jeez, the person wouldn't want to be, well, they are in a hurry, aren't they? They're... How do you, how do these bloody pads come out of here? Oh, there we go. Hey, <laughs> you just rip it. So, yep. Oh, yes. Yes, there we go. So you just get that, you rip it. Bingo. These are your two heart pads. There you go. I presume they've got a, a sticky, yep, and then a sticky adhesive thing. Yep, you peel it off. Yep, that's it here. Mmm, hang on. Whoa, that smells nice. That would have a, uh, a specific uh, dielectric, uh, you know, constant to get you know, like to actually allow the current to pass and things like that. So they'd be specially designed pads. So you've got two of those, whip off, 
put them on the person. Oh no, here we go. It tells you this one must go here. This one must go here. So there you go. You've got to get them around the right way. Presumably, it's not going to work at all. It, it, it might detect it. And if you've got them on back to front, maybe. Um, I don't know, but yeah. There you go. Polarity. It's pretty easy. I mean, average Joe could come along and, and uh, you know, whack these things on, I think. And this one does actually come with a port on here. Check it out. And it actually came with a uh, cable that you plug in, USB cable, so you can actually monitor it. There is like another version of the model from this manufacturer that has like an LCD display in it. You can get the actually the cardiac waveform and everything else. But uh, yeah, so I don't know why you'd, maybe you can use this to monitor to the heart anyway. Mm. And this one's actually uh, reusable. You can actually just whip out the pad and the battery so you can just buy these and uh, that's quite neat, isn't it? I like that. So, you, you know, you don't have to uh, just buy an entirely new machine because these go for about 12, this particular model goes for about 1200 US dollars and it is a current uh, model so you can still buy it. So, I don't know, you might pay an extra 100 or 200 bucks for the pads and the battery pack or something, but certainly cheaper than buying a good one. Anyway, you know what we say here on the EV blog, don't turn it on. Take it apart. Now you certainly wouldn't go taking one of these puppies apart if it was uh, powered up, and uh, or if you've powered it up recently, because the we're going to see a big ass capacitor bank in here, which of course uh, stores the high energy pulse um, up to 200 joules, as I said, for an adult and 50 joules for a child. So maybe. Whether or not they, I don't know whether or not they control the energy coming from one capacitor bank, or maybe they have two. Not entirely uh, sure. We'll find out. But uh, that's we expect to find a big capacitor bank in there. Electronic uh, switching, of course, and uh, maybe some inductors to control the, you know, to take the edge off the pulse or something. And uh, are we are we done taking out all the yeah, there's probably clips on here. Anyway, uh, let's check it out and there'll be a, some micro or some uh, description. And I uh, wouldn't be surprised, it wouldn't surprise me if part of it's um, potted, maybe, uh, IP56 uh, rating. But, you know, these things have to be quite rugged. It'll be designed to be thrown around and all sorts of stuff. So uh, shock and vibration and uh, moisture ingress and things like that should be or uh, well, at least on the high voltage uh, parts of it should be handled fairly well. So, um, oh, I like the little pogo pins on there. Anyway, hang on, try and pry it open. Here we go, it was just stuck with age. Ta-da! Oh, we're in like Flynn. Look at that. Isn't that lovely? I was wrong about the potting, though. There is no potting, and uh, there's our capacitor bank. We've got five caps. Uh, they could be in series... Perhaps giving higher voltage, we'll check out the uh, specs. We've got our, look at it, there's our switching MOSFETs. Um, presumably they're MOSFETs. Uh, let's, yeah, it's interesting. It's all on one board, so it's not, not very complex at all. Let's uh, wiggle these off and get right in there. And I'll show you all the individual parts. Bingo. Oops. Check it out, I pulled the entire connector off the <laughs> off the bare pins down there for the battery. Oops! And it looks like the whole board is just going to lift out. Oh, except for a, uh, yeah, we've got ourselves the ribbon cable. There we go, which goes down to the, yeah, we've got ourselves the speaker. Ah, oh, yeah, double-sided load. Not a huge amount on the back there. We've got some MELF resistors, you know, I'm a MELF... Uh, Bit of a Mel fanboy, and of course the high voltage stuff. There's our diodes. Look, uh, you can automatically instantly see they've got a diode across each cap. That's uh, to prevent, and you can see that the caps are all in series. Look at that. So there's a reason there's a diode across each cap like that is because when you charge up caps in series like that and you discharge them, you don't want any differences in the capacitors to cause one capacitor to actually reverse charge because then uh, it could, well, explode and the magic smoke escapes and you don't want your defibrillator exploding because it'll cause somebody else to have a heart attack and there won't be a second defibrillator around to resuscitate them. So, yeah, there you go. You can see the ground plane all under there, all the digital stuff. 
because uh, we're generating high current uh, pulses down in here, you know. So this is all uh, ground plane around here. That's all for the digital stuff. There's actually, we'll take a look at those, but that's a that's a fair beefy amount of uh, digital goodness down in there. But it's not a huge amount to the uh, energy section at all. We've got a couple of big ass relays in here. Looks like we've got a transformer. In the, oh no, that's an inductor. No, I thought that was a transformer for a second, but one interesting thing is that they've got a backup battery. What is the backup battery for? Well, look, I see a watch crystal down in there, 32.768 kilohertz. That'd be an RTC chip. Why have they got an RTC in this thing? Um, I can only presume that it actually records the time and date of when the incident actually happened. Um, in which case, well, it's, you know, it may not be that the date will be accurate, but the time may not be accurate because it's presumably set at the factory or whoever uh, installed it in the location. But these, the thing with these is that they can sit there for years and the drift, unless you have a really schmick crystal in there, temperature controlled or TCXO or something, it's going to drift like, you know, like a couple of minutes a year, it could be, well, even worse than that, actually, with uh, temperature uh, extremes and things like that. So, yeah. Hmm. Anyway, look, labelled. Sternum Apex. Beauty. And this is a 2007 vintage. Thank you very much. Cornell Dublia, for all you Cornell Dublia fanboys, there you go. 600 mic, 400 volts working, and made in the United States of America. Awesome. If you haven't uh, heard about uh, Cornell Dublia, they are, yeah, top shelf capacitor brand. So um, maybe they would have maybe specifically characterized them for the purpose. Maybe not. They're probably, I don't know, you could go look up the part number and they're just not the shelf one probably. But anyway, they do all have an individual sticker on them. So does that mean that they're a qualified part? I don't know about the requirements. Well, I can tell you that the requirements to get one of these designed and produced and certified for manufacture and public use would be a ridiculous amount of red tape to actually do this. So maybe the parts in here need to be qualified uh, for this particular use. I don't know. Is anyone in the medical electronics field can tell us if these would have been a, you know, a qualified, certified part for use in defibrillators? Let us know. And if you don't know anything about one volts reverse on an electrolytic capacitor is going to potentially do some damage to them. So having a single diode across them, limit them to under one volt, Bob's your uncle. I guess we should actually read the user manual for this thing. It actually shows that it uh, can do like three pulses here by the looks of it, 150 joules, 150 and then 200. So it gives you one shock and then waits, presumably waits 120 second CPR pause. So it'll give them a shock. Then I guess you're supposed to give them CPR and then shock them again. One interesting part of the PCB here is look, like here, here's the string, okay? So all the caps are in series like this, okay? They're 400 working volts each. So one, two, three, four, five. We've got uh, 2000 volts uh, maximum for our capacitor bank here at, what was it? Uh, 600 mic. And you'll notice that the trace comes across here, cap plus and cap minus. So they're actually, this isn't connected to anything except uh, this would be maybe part of the uh, production test jig or something like that would be uh, my guess and they've got some uh, looks like it's some test uh, stickers on here they've gone through the testing process so they might put that down to a bed of nails or something like that and then uh, uh, test across the capacitor bank directly. Okay, so what we've got here is the charging circuitry, the high voltage step up, because, hey, this thing has to be charged to, well, somewhere over a thousand volts, something like that. It's a 2000 volt maximum uh, pack here. I think it's like normally 1500 volts or something like that. Our battery is straight into our input terminals here. So this is on the primary side of the transformer. We've obviously got a switching uh, transistor here. I'm surprised that's just flapping around in the breeze. You know, I'm not a fan of TO220s just flapping around in the breeze. And we've got a 10 turn trimmer, thank you very much. There's no uh, uh, gunk on that to uh, stick that down. So I don't know if somebody's tweaked that at the factory or not. Anyway, um, low impedance path, switching the primary of the transformer here, the, 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 then it'd boost up on the uh, secondary and 
use it to charge the capacitor bank. So that's obviously the location you want it from a low impedance uh, point of view. So I don't know how long it takes to charge this thing up to 200 joules. And if I hold this up to the light, we can see through the board here and you can see the ground plane actually goes from primary to secondary over there. So this is not an isolation transformer. Oh, and there's our MOSFET on the back of the board, by the way, directly on the battery terminal. Look at that, straight over to the uh, secondary side. And this uh, sense circuit here with these high value protection resistors, that's actually sensing the voltage directly across the capacitor bank. So these resistors are obviously providing most of the voltage drop across there. And this is so this only needs to be like low voltage uh, amplification. And that's actually a fairly common technique, dropping the voltage across uh, some two high value resistors there. Um, it's a technique to what's used inside these high voltage differential probes. If you don't know, you might be familiar with these things. You might think that there's some whiz bang proprietary isolation transformer technology in there and stuff like that. No, if you want me to do a, um, I've always wanted to do a uh, tear down a reverse engineering of one of these and I'll let me know if you want me to do it and you'll find it's a similar thing it's basically high value dropper resistors in here actually you know this is like um a 101 division ratio up to you know a th a th what is it yeah plus minus 700 volts and 700 volts common mode but there's actually no transformer isolation inside this thing and the inductor that we've got in here looks like it's going to be uh in series with the output and in series with the uh patient under test part P-U-T, putt. Patient under test, there you go, you're a putt. If you connect it up to this thing, putts. Hmm. Anyway, um, the inductor's going to be in series just to like limit the energy that's being dumped to you, limit the rise time of the uh, pulse that's going into you. Now, curiously, um, in pre like older architectures that weren't intelligent like this, they'll just dumb and they just use uh, capacitor uh, relay and like uh, uh, and inductor switching. They would have the inductor in series to actually create the mono. Uh, phasic waveform, um, but with the new biphasic stuff and all super intelligent and timed and everything else, it's like, yeah, it operates uh, slightly differently, but I believe, but it's still going to uh, limit, you know, you don't want that capacitor bank being dumped, boom, via an instant low impedance straight to the body. So you do want it controlled. So they've obviously got a choice inductor in there. And you'll notice on the back side of that inductor, there's two diodes in series missing here. So that's rather interesting. They would have uh, been used to clamp any back EMF uh, from that inductor, presumably. But uh, yeah, they've decided not to, uh, not to fit those. There's a couple of missing capacitors over here. Don't know what's going on there. But uh, yeah, they're the only, those two are obvious emission. Why they've got two there um, is because diodes can actually what they can do is they can fail short. So like as in a short circuit, that's typical failure mode for a diode. So if you've got one um, just across there, especially in high voltage, high energy stuff like this, if it shorts out, it's gonna, it could ruin your day. But if you've got two of them, then one, then the other can take over and bingo, you know, it's not a problem really. So that's not an uncommon technique on uh, high reliability uh, stuff, which presumably this thing has to meet various reliability standards and things like that. So, which is why I'm surprised that, you know, none, none of the high voltage stuff is actually got any pot in. And there's a couple of things flapping around in the breeze here, you know, vibration. Although this one's, uh, like this one's designed to sit stationary in like a, you know, in, in emergency break glass kind of uh, situation. It's not designed to, um, you know, be out in the field with uh, ambulance officers and uh, things like that. But yeah, you know, I mean, probably like there's no celastic anywhere holding anything down or pot in or anything like that. But still, it's, you know, it's obviously good enough. Let's take a look at the main power packages. There's actually three of these babies here. This one, this one, and this one over here. And these aren't just regular uh, MOSFETs. These are uh, IGBT, super fast 1200 volt uh, transistors designed for, you know, really high, fast, high energy switching. And uh, no surprises for finding those puppies in there at all.
And the other two packages in that uh, little bank there aren't uh, transistors. They're, these are actually SCRs, 30 TPS 12s, once again from International Rectifier. No uh, one hung low rubbish in a, um, you know, a medical uh, grade device like this. And SCRs kind of make sense here because uh, what an SCR does, of course, might have to do a Fundamentals Friday on them, is that once you trigger them, um, on the gate, then they stay latched on and they will deliver, they'll stay on and de in this case deliver the energy from the capacitor bank through to the uh, putt, the person under test. And so the rest, of, so once triggered, the rest of the circuitry can like fail and it doesn't matter. This baby is still going to stay latched on until it, uh, until the energy is bled away and the voltage threshold is, uh, you know, over. It's done. So, yeah, SCR makes sense. And they're 1,200 volt packages, but uh, even those are small fry compared to the big daddy over here, which is doing all the business. Thank you very much. Um, an Ixus uh, CS 2022 MOFI. No, it's an MOF1, whatever the hell that is. Anyway, in this fantastic ISO Plus i4 package, and the reason it's called ISO... Plus, if you can, uh, maybe you can see it, there's a hugely wide pin spacing. There's two pins over here close together and then massive pin spacing here. I'll flip it over. There it is. There's the massive spacing across there and that's how they get the 2200 volts isolation of this baby. I mean, this is a serious bit of kit. And that's a uh, phase control thyristor. You kind of otherwise known as an SCR. Let's not get into the differences, but yeah, thyristor, SCR. Same thing. Works the same way. Once you latch those things on, bam, they're staying on until the voltage drops down to bugger all. Now, please excuse the crudity of the model. I didn't have time to build it to scale or to paint it. This is the Dave Cad Reverse Engineering Edition, and I've just uh, done a little bit of reverse engineering. Hmm, probably, maybe not 100%, but it's going to be close enough for the purposes of today's experiment. And just the, basically, the charging of the capacitor bank and the discharging to the sternum and the apex, uh, positive and negative terminals on here. So let's have a look. Uh, we've got ourselves the six uh, CR123 batteries over here, obviously. We've got a couple of MOSFETs driving the transformer, and of course that transformer there is that one there. So there's our battery input right there, and that's one of the uh, MOSFETs, and the other MOSFET is on the bottom there. So they're just driving the primary of that transformer. There's a current sense resistor, that's that baby there, 68 milliohms, and the secondary of the transformer has just uh, got, whoop, well, either one diode, which is missing, um, or three in series like this, and that just charges the capacitor bank up. And as we've uh, mentioned before, we've got our five big main storage caps, 600 mic, uh, 400 volts each in series with their uh, reverse uh, protection diodes on there to stop them um, re charging in reverse sense and limiting the voltage to under a volt to keep the electrolyte uh, safe inside the things because anything over a volt, a volt can uh, damage ele electrolytic capacitors. Now our output from the cap here, it charges up, okay, so when you first power it on, it'll obviously start this up, it'll charge up the capacitor bank ready to do a discharge. How long that takes to charge up, I don't know, there could be other detection stuff in here and anyway, we're not going to, actually there are various, uh, there is another tap point coming off the capacitor bank as well, which goes off to an amplifier anyway, as there are, um, there are sensing amplifiers directly on the apex and the sternum terminals here. So they just go off to all the control circuitry, etc. Anyway, as soon as you turn on the power, it charges up the capacitor bank and then it's ready for action. Now, it's not going to discharge until such time as, the, as these two SCRs turn on here to go and the relay to go out to the sternum or these IGBTs turn on or uh, these SCRs here turn on. So obviously these would all be switched off in the normal state. The relays would be off, so you'd be relay isolated. There's the two relays there, so you'd be completely safe. Uh, the big Ixus um, 
SCR is that one there. And the big inductor here, the big storage inductor, is that puppy that we've seen in there. And then we've got the, the TPS um, SCR, that one's on the other side here. And two other TPS uh, SCRs, which are identical, are those two there. And the IGBTs, as we've seen, are those two on the front there. And the two relays and the two terminals. And there's the other sense one on which I haven't uh, drawn that. It comes off the main capacitor bank here. Okay, so this is what I think happens when you actually press that uh, shock button. We've got our charge stored on our capacitors here. It's going to go out here, and first of all, it needs to be a positive peak. Okay, so our sternum is the positive terminal. Our apex is the negative uh, terminal here. So obviously, it's not going to be shunted down here. It's going to go through the inductor, and of course, that's going to limit the inrush current to the patient under test, the putt. And then these two SCRs are going to turn on. The relay is going to switch on, and bingo, it's going to go out the sternum through the poor little dude here, like this, ah, and through the dude, and then out, well, please excuse the crudity of this, through the, into the apex uh, terminal, and then where does it have to go? Well, they have to turn this relay on, of course, and then they have to turn this SCR on here. So, bingo, like that, so current flows through the poor schmuck like that. And now you can probably see why we need a big beast 2 kilovolt isolated thyristor here is because, look, it's directly across the capacitor bank there. So, which, you know, has a maximum of uh, 400 volts times 5, 2 kilovolts. So you need a matching 2 kilovolt uh, thyristor in here. And likewise, for this little snubber network across the thyristor here, you need that uh, 2 kilovolt rated cap there as well. But this might come into effect when we go to the negative. So now we have to actually produce our negative poles, but we haven't actually dissipated all the energy in our capacitor bank because there is no second capacitor bank in here, no second storage element in order to give us that uh, negative shock pulse, that biphasic response that we actually need. Sure, this inductor is going to charge up, there's going to be some magnetic field in that inductor, but you know, it just Look at it, There's, you know, it's tiny compared to the any energy storage in these five caps, a little tiny magnetic field in there. So that's not going to do the business. So now we need to reroute this so we can use the rest of the energy in our capacitor bank to shock them in the other direction. Let's give it a go. So I've got some charge still in our capacitor. It's still going to be positive and negative here. So we need to flip it around. So what do we do? Okay, we've got our little dude here again, and he's getting shocked like this, what can we do? Now, I'm not sure if the relays actually uh, switch off at this point and then switch back on. They don't necessarily have to. I suspect they may not because uh, the waveform uh, travels directly negative. So the relays would probably switch on. But what happens is that uh, these two SCRs here, they turn off, okay? So And then they switch on the IGBTs here so that current, uh, so, well, Let's draw it, okay? Relays on through the IGBT like this, and then through here, and this SCR turns off. It was on before, but we go to our capacitor bank. Now, what haven't we switched on yet? Bingo, our big Ixus uh, SCR slash thyristor up here, okay? The capacitor bank is now through here like that. So now we've got the positive here, and the negative actually here, because this is negative of the capacitor, that was opposite to what we had before. We had the positive, the sternum here, and then the apex was at the negative. So bingo, we've now swapped it over and we shock them in the other direction. Current is now flowing this direction instead of that direction like it was before. Too easy. And you'll note also that this uh, TPS um, SCR down here isn't as highly rated as the Ixus one up here because we've now got a lower voltage because we're on the negative part of our waveform. It's a lower voltage, lower energy shock. So therefore, this uh, SCR doesn't need to handle as high a voltage as this Ixus one did with the huge monster pin space in. So here it is. That one is not nearly as high rated as that one with its monster pin pitch on there. It's two kilovolt isolation. And likewise, these two uh, TPSs, they don't have to handle 
uh, the same as well. I you also note that the inductor here, there's going to be some back EMF uh, in that, and they did actually put two diodes in series on the back there, as we've noted before, but they haven't populated them, and so clearly, well, they don't care about because these uh, SCRs are switched off, so it's not a problem for the patient. It's just a matter of uh, voltage rating for the uh, two TPS parts in series there, but anyway, that's it. And of course, in this case, this snubber network here is probably doing something as well. You'll note the two different value resistors in series with those diodes there, so it's probably operating in the negative side like that. So there you go, and hopefully our little putt here is revived. That's the plan anyway, or you just go into CPR. So there you go, I hope you enjoyed that look inside the Samaritan Pad AED Automatic External Defibrillator. And thank you very much George for sending this puppy in. It's really quite interesting and it's, you know, it's a reasonable uh, design. I just would have expected a bit more mechanical uh, robustness in there. But as I said, that's, you know, it's not really fulfilled use. It's designed for locking in a cabinet and, and, cabinet and or, you know, storing like in an office environment or something. You know, a lot of offices will have one of these and you might have somebody uh, who's, you know, done half a day's training on how to use them or, you know, or a couple of people, something like that. And well, you hope it's not one person and then that's the person that has a heart attack. Anyway, these things are pretty foolproof because there's a voice prompt and everything like that. And uh, yeah, by the way, all the voice, I didn't look at the voice stuff. There might be a voice chip in there. Oh, hang on. Yep, there it was, hiding under the label, exactly what I suspected. It's the classic uh, chip quarter, uh, ISD4004 uh, series. They've been bought out by various companies over the years. Anyway, I don't know. Um, but yeah, they're still the in-thing single chip voice recorder. You pre-program in the uh, voices in there, and then this one's an SPI uh, control, but, you know, there are dumber ones that uh, you can just, you know, like five different playback messages or whatever, and you just strobe the pin, and boom, it plays it back. So, too easy. And there's some more analogy goodness and stuff down in there, sense amps and, you know, things like that. Maybe I'll post some uh, uh, high-res uh, teardown photos of this puppy, as I do with most teardowns, but uh, if you're interested, then you can maybe take a look at that. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed that teardown. Thank you very much, George, for sending that in. If you want to discuss it, link's down below. And if you liked it, big thumbs up and all that sort of jazz. Yes, it does help with the uh, search engine rankings and, you know, Google foo and things like that, YouTube foo. Catch you next time. Has an ECG function as well. And we took a look at uh, some of the circuitry last time and, well, some people wanted me to play with this. So, okay, let's see if we can actually get some ECG data out of this. There we go.